Well, good morning. If you have your Bible with you today, and I hope you do, I invite you to open it to 1 Corinthians. You not got me, Jay? It's on. He'll get. I got to get some bass in my voice. I am what I am, Jay. I can't do anything about it. All right, 1 Corinthians 15 is where we're going to be today, continuing our series, The Story of Everything. I hope this has been helpful for you. I was talking to somebody just a few minutes ago before the service about why I think this is such a helpful series, and that is that it really helps us make sense of life in this world. Why is this world the way it is? Why is life like it is? Why do we experience the things we experience in terms of things being so good and beautiful at times and then yet so broken and difficult at times. This series is helping us get our bearings and and orient ourselves in this world. Why is life the way it is? What's it all about? What is the point? Have you ever asked that question? What's the point? I've known a lot of people that have struggled to answer that question in their own life. Several years ago, Uh, Dr. Timothy Carey, who is the director of the Institute for Global Health Research, was writing in uh, Psychology Today magazine, and here's what he said. In my clinical work, it is not uncommon for people to say that they just can't see the point of anything anymore. Some people even tell me that they don't see any point in living. So is there a point? Here's how he answers. Listen to this. The puzzling thing about the point is that nothing has a point and everything has a point. Ironically, at the same time that there is no point, there is also a myriad of points. Life, in fact, is a universe of points. Some points help other points be realized through a hierarchical arrangement. Pairs of points can be configured oppositionally, preventing each other from having any effect and establishing a sense of pointlessness. Points are highly individualized, and there is no inherent pointness to anything or any activity. How many of you are feeling really encouraged yet? How many feel like that's a big help? That's pretty awful, isn't it? And I would say that if that's the best we can do, I mean, this guy's supposed to be an expert, right? If that's the best we can do in trying to figure out the point, we're in pretty bad shape. But thankfully... (laughs) There's more that can be said because God has spoken. God himself has told us the point of this universe, even of our own lives. And that's what we're discovering together in this series. And so today as we get into this third part, this third chapter, the story of redemption, we're discovering the point of it all. This really is the high point of the entire story, redemption. Redemption simply means to secure someone's freedom. So in the ancient world, that term was used maybe in the slave market where someone purchased freedom for that individual. In our context, we understand that God has purchased our freedom from sin and death through Christ. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's read our text together and see what God has said. 1 Corinthians 15 I invite you to follow along as I read verses 1 through 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. We know that you inspired Paul to write as he did for our good and for your glory. And so help help that to be our priority now. Help us to receive this word as we should. Help us to understand and apply it in our own lives so that we could be who you've called us to be. We trust you to be our teacher now in these few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you see on the screen, this series is called The Story of Everything. Think for just a moment about your favorite story. 
What is your favorite story? Maybe it's a story your mother told you when you were a child. Maybe you've got a novel you really like or even just a movie that you've watched over and over and over and it's your favorite story. Whether or not we realize it, all good stories have certain things in common. All good stories have certain elements that come together to make that story what it is. You might remember learning about this back in English class. All good stories, for instance, have a plot, right? There's a discernible plot that you can follow through the story. There's a theme. That's like the main idea or message that they're trying to get across. Good stories also have some sort of conflict, right? A struggle of some sort, a confrontation or a clash of interests that has to be dealt with. Without that sort of thing, the story's just really boring, right? And you can identify these elements in your favorite story. If you think about that story, whatever it is, you can see what the plot is. You can understand what the main conflict is. You see these elements in any good story. Good stories also have a climax, right? The climax is where it starts to get really good, where everything comes to a head. This is what the entire story has been building to, this moment of climax. And I would say that in this story of everything right now, we are coming to the climax. This is what everything has been leading up to. When we start to talk about the death and resurrection of Christ, this is the high point of the story. So let me give you just a little bit of context for these verses we're going to be discussing together this morning. As I've already mentioned, Paul wrote these words. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth as somebody that was very familiar with them in their church. He had ministered in that city. He had been a big part in seeing that church planted. He had taught the people the gospel there. He had, had really helped them in their early stages of their faith. And then he moved on and other leaders stepped in and helped them at different points. And yet, even though he was no longer with them physically, he cared about them a great deal. And he had heard that they were struggling in a lot of different ways. And so out, throughout this letter of 1 Corinthians, he helps them think through some of the challenges they're facing. Some of it was, was doctrinal. Some of it was just the way they relate to each other in the church. Nobody else has ever had any problems with that, right? But the church in Corinth did. And so he's helping them think through these different challenges. And here in chapter 15, we see that one of the things they were dealing with was some confusion about the doctrine of the resurrection. And, and so that's what he's highlighting here in this chapter. And that's what we're going to be focusing on as we lead up to, to Resurrection Sunday. But he wants these people to understand and remember the core truths of his message. And so look at verse 1. He says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. So he's, he's asking them to think back to the time when he was with them. He's reminding them, look, this is the exact message I brought you. This is what I preached when I was there with you. And, and he calls it the gospel. As you probably know, that word gospel means good news. He says, I brought you this good news. And don't you love it when somebody shows up with good news? Isn't that always encouraging when somebody walks in and says, I got good news for you. Well, that's what Paul did. He brought good news to the Corinthians. And, and what is this news? Well, that's what he lays out for us in the next few verses. But, but think about what he says here. He says, The gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you're being saved. So so he says this is good news, and he says this is the message I preached. I didn't focus on anything else. This was the, the main point of my ministry. I preached this good news. You received it. Think about what that means. They not only heard it, they really received it in a personal way. Reminds me of 1 Thessalonians 2.13 when he wrote to the Thessalonians, when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. So they really received it by faith. They listened and they accepted this message, this gospel. So he preached it, they received it. Then he also says that they are standing in it, right? At the end of verse 1, in which you stand. That means it's not something that, that they heard and then eventually kind of forgot. It's not something that they moved past at some point. They not only received it initially, they are still standing in it. It is the foundation. It is the solid rock on which they stand. It's true for their church. That's true for our church. 
That's true for any faithful church. This is the message in which we stand. You never move past this gospel. You don't outgrow it. You need it and I need it just as much today as we did the very first time we heard it. We stand in this message. And then in verse 2, he says it's by this gospel they are being saved, right? In or by which you are being saved. This is the only message that has such saving power. Okay, so think about this. Whatever it is he's getting ready to lay out as this gospel message, it really matters, okay? I mean, he's already said that this is the gospel that he preached, that they received, in which they stand, by which they're being saved. I mean, he really is trying to emphasize this here. And then as if he hadn't already got his point across, in verse 3, he says he passed it on as of first importance. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So whatever he's getting ready to say next, we better pay attention. He's saying nothing matters more than this. And I do find it interesting that he says he received this message. He didn't make it up on his own. He didn't just come up with it. He received it from others. By the time Paul believed in Jesus, there were already others who were believing in Jesus. There were other Christians, the apostles and others, and, and he received this truth from them. And if you think about it, that's why we're here too. We've all received this truth from somebody else. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher or a preacher. Somebody at some point in your life told you the good news. And, and I think that should be motivation for us. Like, let's not let that chain stop with us, okay? Like, if it's been passed on to us, let's do our part to pass it on to others, just as Paul's doing here. So what is this message, this gospel that's so important? Well, look at verses 3 and 4 again. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This is is what matters most this is the best thing and in our lives and in the life of our church we can often get distracted right there are a lot of other good things but only one best thing (laughs) there are a lot of things that that matter but there's only one thing that matters the most and paul's saying this is it don't allow yourself to get distracted from this message so let's think about the elements of this gospel first christ died he died but his death was unique it wasn't like any other death because paul says here he died for our sins nobody else has done that jesus is the only one that's died for our sins and this teaches us something important if if we'll receive this truth this helps us understand something that we might think we know but sometimes we forget we are sinners each and every one of us we're sinners it means on our own we stand guilty and condemned before a holy god that's not a pleasant message to hear but it's important and it's true this is why we so desperately need the saving that he mentioned back in verse 2 paul would write to the romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god all of us you me everyone you've ever met we are all sinners and that's a problem (laughs) that's a big problem because our sin separates us from god we were created to know him to enjoy a personal relationship with him but because of our sin that relationship has been fractured and if we want to know god as we were created to if we ever want to be who we were created to be our sin problem needs to be taken care of. If we ever want to have the hope of salvation and eternal life, our sin has to be dealt with. And Paul also wrote to the Romans that the wages of sin, that is what you earn as a sinner, the wages of sin is death. Again, that's a problem, right? It's a problem for each of us personally. And that's exactly why Christ died. Again, what does it say? Christ died for our sins. He didn't have to pay the the penalty for his own sins. 
He didn't earn that wage on his own. He, he never sinned. He was perfect. He completely and perfectly obeyed the will of his father in every way. So he didn't have any of his own sins to die for. That's why he could be our substitute and our sacrifice. He lived the life that none of us could ever live. And yet he died the death that each of us deserve to die. So he died for our sins. But notice that little phrase that comes next. This is really important for the purpose of this series we're in. Paul says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That's really important. Don't, don't skip over that. When he wrote this, the scriptures in view here would have been the Old Testament scriptures. And Paul's saying that the death of Christ happened according to what was written in those Old Testament scriptures. What does he mean by that? How is that so? What he means is that this all happened according to plan. This was God's plan all along. This is where the story has been leading us from the very beginning. This was not some sort of plan B. Let's think about where we've been so far in this series. In the last few weeks, we've talked about creation and the fall. So think back to creation. God created everyone and everything for his own glory with great purpose and intentionality. He, he made this entire universe and everyone and everything that fills it. He, he made us humanity to be like him in a special way the bible says he made us in his own image so that we could reflect his goodness and represent him and relate to him in a way that no other creature can and, and though we were created to know him and enjoy him forever as we've heard in recent weeks and as we know from genesis 3 the first humans turned from god disobeyed him threw all of creation into chaos and each one of us has done the same thing we have all rebelled against our good creator god and so again our relationship with him is fractured but it's not just us it's this whole world as we saw last week everything has been thrown off kilter everything is broken in some way all of creation is groaning under the curse and the consequence of sin and, and as soon as sin entered into God's good creation, what did God do? He started making promises, right? He started making promises that one day things would be made right. He told the serpent who had deceived Eve that one day her offspring would strike his head. Later on, when you get to Genesis 12, after the, the Tower of Babel that we, we learned about last week, God, God picks this one man from one of those people groups. He picks a man named Abram, and he says, it's going to be through you and your family that all the families of the earth are blessed. He makes that amazing promise to him. And then generations later, once the kingdom has been established and David is sitting on the throne, David, who is a descendant of that man Abraham, God says to him, one day... Your, your son is going to rule after you. He says, I'll raise up your offspring after you and establish his kingdom forever and ever. So these are huge, grand promises talking about all people everywhere, forever and ever. And, and the rest of the Old Testament is, is tracing how the people of God held on to those promises how they were awaiting the fulfillment of those promises, how through the good times and the bad, through their disobedience and their struggling to be faithful, they were longing for that day that was to come. And then when you get to the New Testament, you open up the Gospel of Matthew and the very first verse calls Jesus the son of David, the son of Abraham. We kind of skip over that sometimes, but think about what that means. That means that Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. Jesus is the one who will rule forever. He's the one in whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. He's the one who will strike the head of the serpent. This is the one that it all points to. And so, as we said, this is the climax of the story. This is the high point. That's what Paul means when he says that Christ died in accordance with the scriptures or according to the scriptures it's all been pointing to this all along and we could look at numerous passages we don't have time to look at all of them today but but think about just a few of the passages in the old testament that that gave us hints about what was going to happen with the death of christ we've already mentioned genesis three fifteen, right that promise that 
the offspring of the woman would strike the head of the serpent. Just a few verses later at the end of chapter 3, verse 21, after God has told Adam and Eve about the consequences of their sin in, in, in chapter 3, verse 21, it says that he made garments of skin and clothed them. Remember, they had tried to cover their own nakedness with, with fig leaves. They didn't cut it. They needed something better. So God covered the shame and nakedness of his people with garments of skin. How do you get garments of skin? Something's got to die. So innocent blood was spilled to cover his people. Then you move forward in Genesis. You talk about chapter 22 when Abraham is called to, to sacrifice his son Isaac on the mountain. And what does God do? He provides a substitute sacrifice, right? So that the blood of that animal is spilled instead of the blood of Isaac. Think about the book of Exodus with the Passover. The angel of death is coming through, and what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to put the blood of a spotless lamb on the door of their homes. And when the, the blood is on the doorway, death will pass over them. They'll be saved. They'll be spared. Think on ahead to, to what happened with the ministry of the priests. Think about the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, that one day each year when the priest was supposed to go into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, in the inner part of the tabernacle. He was supposed to, to bring two goats with him. One, he sacrificed. He, he spilled the blood of that animal as a sacrifice to, to absorb the wrath of God against these sinners in the community. But then do you remember what he did with the other goat? He laid his hands on it. He confessed on that animal all the sins of the people and then he let it go out into the wilderness where those sins would never be seen or heard from again. So in both of those animals, we see a picture of Christ, right? He, he bears the wrath of God in our place and he takes our sin from us. These are pictures that are supposed to make us think about Jesus. Isaiah 53, one of the most famous prophecies in the old testament about the suffering servant these words were written some 700 years before jesus was even born the the prophet says surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows he was wounded for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities all along the way god had been telling us what was going to happen this happened in accordance with the scriptures Jesus died according to God's plan. And it is worth pointing out, like, he really actually died. Okay, this isn't just some sort of myth. This isn't some sort of legend. He really died. Even the most skeptical or critical scholars will accept that as a historical fact. He was dead as dead can be. Heart stopped, no brain activity, no pulse, no breath in the lungs, dead. Any, anybody in here a fan of the old movie, The Princess Bride? Anybody remember that movie? Well, you might remember the scene where Wesley's been tortured. He appears to be dead. Inigo Montoya takes his friend's body to Miracle Max, hoping that there's something he can do. But he says he's already dead. Miracle Max says, well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. Remember that? There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Friends, Jesus was all dead. Totally dead. The Son of God. Dead. For our sins. But that's not the end of the story, is it? <laughs> I mean, we need to, to come to terms with what an amazing, astonishing thing that is. But we also need to keep reading. Jesus was dead, and then he was buried, right? We know, Paul doesn't mention it here, but we know that Jesus was buried by friends in a borrowed tomb. John 19, you can read about this. John 19, 38 through 42 says, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. 
So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, I think we've all probably experienced what it's like to bury a loved one. It's a horrible experience, isn't it? But think again about how unique this individual was and how unique this death was. I mean, they had placed all their hopes on him. And now he was dead, and they were at a loss to understand what was happening. But again, that's not the end of the story, is it? Again, look at verse 4. He was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That is simply incredible. Sometimes we get too familiar with a statement like that. That is absolutely astonishing. Jesus was dead, and now he's alive. He has defeated death. I mean, that changes everything. Nothing can be the same after something like that happens. This is why we follow him. This is why we worship him. This is why we obey him as Lord and Savior. You know, a a lot of people follow different religious leaders and different gurus and different you know, historical faiths, and yet if you think about those people, they're all dead and gone. And I don't have any interest in following a dead person, but I will follow someone who can walk out of their own grave. And that's Jesus. It's only Jesus. This is absolutely astonishing. And again, this was part of the plan. Paul says this happened according to the scriptures. And sometimes that can be confusing because when we think about the Old Testament, there don't seem to be as many passages that clearly point to the resurrection as there are passages that clearly point to the death of Jesus. And so sometimes people question, well, how exactly did this happen in accordance with the Scriptures? Well, it's, it's not as clearly seen in as many passages, but again, there were hints. There was a foreshadowing of this. Think about the passage I read from earlier, Isaiah 53, that passage of the suffering servant. We read there about how he dies, but then in verse 10, we see a picture of of ultimate vindication and victory. So verse 10 of that chapter says, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. So he dies, but then ultimately his days are prolonged and he sees his offspring. Death is not the end for the suffering servant of God. The resurrection is implied there. But one of the places that Jesus himself pointed to in terms of the Old Testament speaking about the resurrection was the book of Jonah. Remember this? Jesus said, Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So so Jesus predicted that that's what was going to happen to him. And ultimately, it had been predicted all along, like this was all God's plan. They were hints of what was to come. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that was promised in the Old Testament. And that shouldn't surprise us, because as Christians... We believe the whole Bible is ultimately about him. In Luke 24, after the resurrection, you might remember when Jesus appeared to two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus. He was chatting with them. They were trying to make sense of everything that had happened. And Luke 24 says that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. I would love to have heard that. That would have been awesome. In all the scriptures, there are things concerning him. It's all about him. I don't know, uh, some of you may have used the resource we've used with our kids over the years, the Jesus Storybook Bible. And, And it says over and over, every story whispers his name. It's all about him. That's what we're reading here. So if we don't read the whole Bible with an eye toward Jesus, we're going to miss the point. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about what he's done for us, as Paul says right here. So think about this with me. If this is what the Bible's all about, don't you think this is what we should be all about? 
if Paul says this is what's most important, don't you think this is what should be most important to us as individuals and as a church? If this is at the heart of God's plan for his entire creation, don't you think this should be at the heart of all our plans? Paul says this is of first importance. He can't be any clearer about that. So this, I think, is an important question for us to consider in our lives, in our church, in our plans and priorities. What's actually most important to us? I'm afraid sometimes we talk a good game and we say, yeah, this is what matters most. This is what it's all about. But then it kind of trickles down the priority list if we're not careful. We start to, to major on the minors and give more of our attention and more of our time and more of our energy to other lesser things. And it's not that there aren't other things that are important. There's a lot in life that's important. But there's only one thing that's most important. And that's the gospel. So everything we do as a church, as individuals, must be tethered to this good news. It must remain central. Don't get distracted. Don't let other things blur your vision. Stay focused on Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection. That's what it's all about. That is the point. So as we close, I want to go back to something I said at the beginning. I said that all good stories have some things in common, right? And again, you can recognize that if you think about the stories you like to listen to or watch over and over. They all have certain elements in common. But have you ever wondered why that is? Like, why is it that even though we've, we've seen that, that type of story play out over and over and over and over, we still love it? Why is it that we never get tired of a story with a good ending where they all live happily ever after? Why is it when a story is missing one of those elements, it doesn't sit right with us and we think, what? That's it? Come on now. I think, I really believe that the reason those good stories resonate so much with us deep down in our hearts is that even though we don't often think about it, there's something within us that knows we're caught up in this great story. We are part of this true story of everything. And we are longing for redemption and we are longing for that happy ending and so when we when we hear those stories when we see those stories it hits us deep down whether or not you like to think about it you are caught up in this great story of everything and you have a part to play again you were created to know God and to enjoy him forever and yet because of your sin, apart from Christ, you remain separated from God. So if you ever want to be who you were created to be, if you ever want to experience life the way you were meant to, you need to trust in this Jesus who lived for us and died for us and rose again for us and for our sins. What is the point? This is the point. This is why you are alive. So if you don't know Jesus, you can turn to him even today. Even right now in this moment in the quietness of your own heart. You can confess your sin and, and turn to him in faith. If you've not done that, I hope you will. If you're here today and, and you are already following this Jesus, I hope that this passage serves as a reminder and a motivation to keep the main things the main things. To focus on him to live your life for his glory because of all that he's done for you. I'm so excited for us to continue to walk through this passage over the next few weeks as we lead up to Easter Sunday. But I hope this has been a helpful reminder about what matters most. If you have questions about this, if you want to talk more, please come find me, find Pastor Lee. We would be happy to continue the conversation. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you that you've revealed yourself to us and you've spoken about these things in, in a way that we can not only understand, but that we can fully trust and rely upon. Help us to believe 
these words. Help us to live in light of them. You've just been so good to us. It's almost, almost too good to be true, and yet we know it is because we see it in your word and we've experienced it in our own lives. Thank you for this time we've gotten this morning to celebrate these things together. Continue your work in each of our lives and in our church for our good and your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. God bless. Have a great day.